to sort of widen um, our thoughts this morning to, to Scotland, let us go to Scotland right now, where this week's banking bailout has potentially changed the landscape of the debate over future independence altogether. It has been 18 months since Alex Salmond's nationalist SNP took the reins north of the border and Scotland was booming, built on twin pillars of Scottish banking, the Royal Bank of Scotland and Halifax Bank of Scotland. It did seem King Alex could do no wrong. Riding high in the polls, King Alex boldly proclaimed Scotland could break away from the UK and form this arc of prosperity with Scandinavia, Ireland and Iceland. But then Iceland's banking system imploded and both the Royal Bank of Scotland and HBOS had to go cap in hand to, of all people, Westminster. It's me, James! So, has the financial crisis left Salmon's dream of independence in tartan tatters? Well, the Centre for Economic and Business Research said this week political independence was never, ever very likely. But this makes it pretty much impossible. And another leading economist told us that Scotland's economy was particularly exposed to the banking crisis. Well, well, Scotland has a, an interesting economic structure. It's obviously heavily reliant on oil and manufacturing. But Edinburgh is one of the world's 20 largest in financial centres, and that means Scotland's probably more exposed to this financial crisis than many other European countries. Banking sector is very large, the insurance sector is very large, and that means that the Scottish taxpayer might have to pick up a large bill if they are independent for bailing out the banking sector. Well, we've been on the streets of Glasgow to see if attitudes towards independence have changed following the financial crisis. I just think you know, Gordon Brown has, has, to an extent, almost isolated us here, and along with Alistair Darling, they're looking at the bigger picture down south. There's an awful lot of this being driven by the Bank of England, and I, I don't see that we're being able to make our own decisions. If we're independent, we'll obviously look into the euro, and so I'll be protected by the EU. So I don't see any difference whatsoever. I'm just looking at the Iceland situation and I know that had been used as an example of why Scotland should nationalise and the state they're in is a lot worse um, and they've nobody to call on so I would say that it's been beneficial that we're still part of the UK. Every time you pick up the paper it's some, there's 800 jobs out at East Kilbride or there's so many jobs so we have to keep links. So those are the voices from Glasgow. Let's hear a voice from Perth now, attending his party's conference in Perth. First Minister Alex Salmond is with us. Um, that arc of prosperity, has it somehow wound itself round your neck in political terms now? Well, I doubt it very much. I mean, obviously, Iceland has severe problems. Uh, so does America, where 17 banks have gone down the most powerful and largest country in the world. And so, of course, does the UK. And it is, of course, under the United Kingdom and Gordon Brown's economic management that the Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank of Scotland and indeed other banks like Northern Rock and Bradford and Binley have run into such trouble. And I suspect people will glance across the North Sea to Norway where they'll see a country which not just has secured its financial sector but luckily for Norway has an oil fund of £200,000 million underpinning both its financial sector and its economy and is one of the few countries in Europe, unlike the United Kingdom, which is currently forecast not to go into recession, not to have the extent of job losses, and is best place to join in the recovery when it comes. Well, so with, I think we'll take a lot of lessons respect, and wish that Scotland were in that position. With respect, Mr Salmond, it, it is not as clear a picture as you are making out with Norway. Norway took 30 years to build up that kind of reserve, and also um, a lot of that is, is ring-fenced for pensions. So it isn't, it isn't the shining example. Uh, with money sloshing around, as you'd suggest. Well, can I just correct you in two points? The, the Norwegian Oil Fund actually had its first payments 12 years ago, not 30 years ago, but you know, that's a good argument for starting an oil fund in Scotland. Uh, and secondly, Norway secured its banking sector last weekend with a, a 35,000 million bond issue, uh, indicating that uh, countries, small countries can do it and avoid going into recession, unlike the United Kingdom. Uh, and incidentally, I mean, I, I don't. Uh, I supported the emergency measures to stabilise the banking sector, uh, but I wouldn't describe them as being of munificence. I mean, the, the premium that the that the government is asking for from its boss and the Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyd's TSB, for that matter, on the preference share issue is 12 percent. I mean, Warren Buffett is only asking for 10 percent from Goldman Sachs. So. 
the UK government intends to make a profit out of the difficulties of the Scottish banking sector. So let's just wait and wake up to where the money's going. Let me put it to you this way. If Scotland had had full independence when this crisis struck, where would you have gone? As First Minister, where would you have gone asking for help first? Well, you say asking for help, and I'll come to that in a second, but would have taken decisive action like the Irish government did three weeks ago to stabilise the financial sector, or would have done what the Norwegians did last weekend to stabilise their financial sector. So this idea that only small countries have been exposed to this global crisis is total nonsense. And as far as going cap in hand is concerned, you will recall that at the end of September, the United Kingdom, the Bank of England, have got an $80 billion currency swap. Now, if we describe what the Irish and Norwegians doing as cap in hand, then it's cap in hand that the UK government went as well. well there are many examples of uh, countries around the world coping with the international circumstances far, far better than the United Kingdom is, and we'll look to them for inspiration and comfort. Well, what OK, you if, you're, if, you're, if you are looking to them... economic times, bad or good. Right, if you're looking to them for, for Say inspiration... Again. Remember, I'm, on a, I'm at the end of a line here. OK, if you, if you are again. looking to them for inspiration, then do you take inspiration from their hike in taxation? Ireland's uh, budget this week has put a new super tax on incomes. Norway has a high tax regime as well, not to mention uh, high fuel taxes. Is that what you're telling the people of Scotland they can expect? Well, Ireland is 40% per head more prosperous than the United Kingdom. It's certainly going into recession. Unfortunately, that's where the United Kingdom is heading at the present moment. When the countries come out of recession, I suspect that Ireland will still be 40% per head more prosperous than the United Kingdom. And as for Norway, Norway is 80% per head more prosperous than the United Kingdom. And if you asked anyone in Scotland, would they like to be in Norway's position with that £200,000 million oil fund? built up over the last 12 years, and we think that Scotland should do that over the next 30 years, then the answer would be undoubtedly yes. Well, let because me... countries with the opportunity to use their natural resources are in a better position than countries which don't have that opportunity. Right. Well, there, I mean, there is a delay on the line, so forgive me for, for butting in continuously. Not very successfully, as it happens. But Sarah Sands, uh, is this now well, I mean, uh, delay, the, the, the end of the line for, for arguments that Scotland can survive on its own? What do you make of this? Oh, it is. It's an extraordinary turn of events. You know, you have David Cameron and um, attacking Gordon Brown for embracing the free market. And now you have a Scottish Prime Minister deeply distrusted in England who's being held responsible for the ruin of Scotland, as it turns out. Um, but I don't see how they finance themselves. Um, I see oil prices are coming down, but um, you know, they've never actually been able to, um, and they can't just simply say that the oil's ours and just put their arms around it. So I think, um, actually, it's a rather happy consequence, as far as I'm concerned, that we have a United Kingdom. Yeah. I, I broadly agree with that. I think too much of the economics of independence are a bet on the oil price. I very much doubt that had Scotland been independent last week, it wouldn't have been coming south of the border to ask a foreign government in England to guarantee its bank deposits. I'm sure that would have happened. I think it has dealt a blow to the question of independence. Every time the Scottish people have been asked, they've said they don't want independence. And I think this is showing their wisdom. Right. Um, Alex Salmon, just uh, ver very briefly, just to add something else into the mix. Uh, Sir Kenneth Callum is reconsidering the Barnet formula, um, something which is, uh, well, many, many fists are shaken at it from, from your side of the fence um, for saying it isn't generous enough. He says it, it might be too generous. It's not fair to England. So what do you make of, of his considerations and deliberations? Well, if either of your uh, incredibly impartial London commentators had bothered to look at the <laughs> government expenditure and revenue uh, from uh, this summer, uh, they would have seen that even two years ago in the most recent figures uh, that Scotland was more than paying its way in the United Kingdom. So I'll be happy to scrap the Barnet formula if we move to a position where Scotland can raise its own revenue and govern its own spending, and then England and the rest of the UK can do exactly the same thing. Now, what on earth could be fairer than that? Or behind the prejudice that your uh, commentators down in London show is a perhaps a nagging doubt at the back of their minds that the £250,000 million received by the Treasury from Scottish oil revenues over the last quarter of a century is probably what kept successive chancellors in the style to which they became okay. accustomed. And it might be that a country which governs its own resources would do rather better than many of your London commentators. Absolutely. I think that's what the Scottish people will decide. Alex Salmon, thank you very much. Uh, now